Welcome to FRC Media News for Thursday, May 9th, 2019. I'm Keith Thibault. Tonight we look into the altercation between a student and police at Resiliency Prep in Fall River last week. We have an update on an integration plan between two local chambers of commerce and tell you how you can help local postal workers provide food for needy families this Saturday. We'll have those and other stories coming up, but first let's check in with the news headlines of the week. We bring in on the phone Phil Devitt, the digital news editor at the Herald News. Phil, welcome back. How are you? I'm doing just fine, Keith. Thanks for having me. Yeah, let's start with an incident that is actually about a week old now, uh, probably around the time we were uh, doing this newscast last week. There was an altercation between a student and uh, resource officers at Resiliency Preparatory Academy uh, in, in Fall River. Uh, there was a short video of that incident that was posted across social media. There was some outcry over how some people saw how the police handled uh, the incident. Um, what ended up happening was the school department and the police uh, looked at the, uh, the information and investigated the incident, and both the uh, police department and the school department found that the police really did nothing wrong in handling the situation. Phil, in, in instances like this, it's always difficult to uh, try to base people's opinions based on short videos. And even the video that the uh, police department released, which was closed circuit video of the office area at the school, um, you know, was edited and may not have shown everything. It's really difficult to try to report on something like this, isn't it? It is difficult. It's been difficult from uh, the, the start, really. Uh, I remember it was about a week ago that this video hit the internet, and yeah. it just, I mean, I, it went instantly viral uh, everywhere. And it was a 10 second clip, like you said. So you're dealing with uh, a couple of obstacles there. Number one, it's a uh, really grainy video. This isn't professionally shot. This was, uh, I believe, on a cell phone. Uh, it's shaky video, so it's, it's not showing um, the full scene. It's sort of kind of, um, you know, shifts focus a couple of times. And uh, to top it off, it's really, really quick. So there's a lot going on in a very short period of time on a video that's not very easy to see. And in our initial reporting uh, on this, I remember um, just sitting with uh, our reporter, Amanda Burke, uh, trying to decide, do we say that the officer is punching a student here or striking him? You know, and what's the difference? We were really going back and forth. Like, can we be certain that this officer is, is um, uh, sort of making contact with this student with a closed fist? Uh, yeah. Details like that matter more than anything uh, in a story like this. And like you said, um, police uh, eventually released a uh, three-minute um, video um, of what they said was edited footage um, shot by several security cameras in the school. Um, adds a little bit more to the story. Uh, it shows uh, this student uh, prior to the 10-second video um, sort of causing a scene in the administrative offices of the school, um, sort of throwing some things around. Uh, being difficult uh, with uh, police officers. Um, but again, edited video, uh, unless we were actually there, uh, we don't know the full story. Um, but we can say for sure that the police department and the school department are uh, in agreement on this, that uh, the use of force was uh, justified. Uh, and that's the big story this week. Yeah. Has there been any indication, have any of your reporters spoken to the family of the student and whether they seem to think that there may be some type of charges maybe against the police department if they feel that they were wronged in this case. Well, we're not done with the story uh, yet. We're, we're still um, looking into some of those angles there. Um, you know, uh, we, uh, we definitely uh, are interested in what the family has to say. I was speaking with a reporter this morning um, also about, you know, other students. What's what do other students uh, in, in this school in particular, but also in general, um, feel ab about uh, this story, uh, perception, um, and uh, you know, their relationship with the police? Uh, so there's uh, you know, a, a lot of different opinions on this and a lot of different people uh, who, who want to weigh in. Uh, and uh, we hope to present that reporting uh, in, a, in a timely and responsible way. Yeah, and, and regardless, it uh, looks like uh, the police department's job have gotten a lot more uh, difficult with the instances that we've seen in the past of 
uh, what has proven to be excessive force on the part of police officers against some, some of those in custody. And, um, you know, it's, it's a time that uh, all police departments are reflecting about their procedures and, and going over that. So this is a story I'm sure we will uh, be following along with you, Phil, um, at the Herald. Uh, our other story of the week um, came uh, involving uh, Mayor Correa. Mayor Jesio Correa uh, apparently last week took some vacation time, went to uh, Las Vegas. There was a photo of someone who was uh, also at the same resort that the mayor was at in Las Vegas, recognized the mayor, happened to be a local resident, uh, took a photo of, of, of the mayor, uh, appeared to be at a blackjack table outside of, I believe, Caesar's Palace, and uh, sent that in uh, to the Herald and shared it with other uh, media folks. And the question was that um, very few people knew where the mayor were, was in terms of leaving the city on vacation. And there's been some discussion, Phil, over what the procedure really is when the mayor is out of town. Fill us in on what you know. Right. So, uh, you know, the, some people will read the story and say, well, so what? Everyone's entitled to a vacation right. and to go wherever they'd like to go. And, and certainly that's true. But the story in this case is that it appeared, uh, you know, some of the people that the, the mayor works with uh, closely or is supposed to work with closely were unaware of his absence, unaware that he was out of the state even. Um, and, and so this, uh, you know, quickly to us became uh, a story. Uh, mm -hmm. The mayor was contacted by the newspaper, uh, and he pretty much said um, by a text that uh, he, um, you know, didn't feel that he needed to notify anybody that he was out of the city and that the issue was being blown out of proportion. Um, you have the city charter, which uh, addresses temporary absences of the mayor, um, and uh, I have uh, uh, some of the language in front of me indicating that a reason of sickness or other cause, right. the mayor is unable to perform the duties of office, and that the city council uh, president would temporarily take over day-to-day -day duties in that case. Um, a vacation wouldn't necessarily mean that the mayor is unable to perform his duties. Uh, uh, even the city council uh, president, Cliff Ponce, acknowledged that. But if the mayor had communicated his absence, uh, it wouldn't have been as big an issue uh, to the council. Right. Um, now, of course, you also have Mayor Correa um, under a federal indictment. Mm -hmm. A condition um, of his bail is that he gives his probation officer notice if he's leaving the state for more than a day. Um, we, uh, we don't have uh, confirmation if that took place, but we do know that Mayor Correa is unable to leave the country. Uh, he had to surrender his passport after he was arrested in October. Right. So there are a few different layers to this. And, of course, uh, next week's going to be, if we can sort of look ahead a little bit, next week, less than a week, actually, uh, by Wednesday, the mayor is scheduled to, or, or needs to, by the charter, present his fiscal 2020 uh, budget to the city council. Uh, any idea when that will happen? And I know there's been discussions in terms of uh, some of the, the, the revenue figures in there and, and talk of maybe even starting to collect the, uh, the uh, override, the debt exclusion related to the new BMC Jerfee High School? Yes, well, this is a busy time in city government, no question, um, regardless of us nearing the end of the fiscal year, which is in and of itself um, a, a big, big thing. Um, the mayor is facing a May 15th deadline to present the uh, fiscal 2020 budget to the city council. Um, and uh, in a joint meeting between the council and the school committee uh, called by the mayor, uh, it was discussed for several hours the this unexpected increase in school transportation by nearly $2 million. That's another thing that we have to grapple with. Mm -hmm. um, right. And the administration is also proposing to uh, advance to the 2020 budget the uh, debt exclusion bond payment, as you mentioned, for Derby High. Uh, that project was uh, to start charging taxpayers in 2023 to raise an additional $2.1 million annually. Uh, so there's a, a, lot, a lot to juggle here, a lot of city, bu city business to take care of. Uh, the mayor uh, was uh, assured uh, people here in the city he was back on Monday and uh, was in a meeting on Tuesday. And uh, our reporter, Joe Good, uh, was just, uh, just came from a TIFF meeting uh, at which uh, the mayor also appeared. So right. uh, we do know he's back here this week uh, and, and working. And uh, no doubt we'll probably be talking about the 2020 fiscal city budget when we talk next week. So until then, Phil, what else is coming up at the paper? Sounds good, Keith. Thank you very much. All right. We'll have more FRC Media News right after this.
some job descriptions on the latest hot jobs list from the Mass Hire Fall River Career Center. Quality Control Inspector, Tech Edge Incorporated, located at 100 Riggenbach Road, is in need of a full-time quality control inspector to inspect products using scopes, gauges, coordinate measuring machine, scales, micrometers, calipers, and vision prior to shipment. Job number 121-18300. Automotive Business Development Manager, Herb Chambers Companies, located at 1321 South Main Street, is looking for a full-time automotive business development manager to coach, track, and motivate your team using industry-leading tools to answer clients' questions and to schedule appointments to visit our dealerships. Job number 121-18386. RN Case Manager, Accent Care Incorporated, is looking for a full-time RN Case Manager to develop plans of care and utilize nursing theories, skills, and techniques to provide quality care to clients on a daily basis in the Fall River area. Job number 121-17627. South Coast Health, located at 363 Highland Avenue, is looking to fulfill the following full and part-time positions. Courier, job number 121-15059. Food service worker, job number 121-14899. Blount Fine Foods, located at 630 Current Road, is also looking to fulfill the following full and part-time positions. Maintenance Technician, job number 12107752. Bilingual Packed Supervisor, job number 12107743. For more information on these or other positions, visit masshiredjobquest.detma.org or call the Mass Hire Fall River Career Center at 508-730-5000. The South Coast Chambers of Commerce and the Bristol County Chamber of Commerce are continuing their discussion on how the two organizations can integrate their services for the betterment of all their members and business interests in the region. The integration that we're doing really is, is a, it's a coming together of two very strong organizations. Both the South Coast Chamber and the Bristol County Chamber um, are very successful, they're very stable, strong organizations. A merger frequently will, uh, is usually a coming together of two organizations where one may not necessarily um, be really strong, be very stable. Um, that's kind of the biggest difference is this is a coming together of two equals that are very strong organizations and we're gonna build um, we're gonna build on what we have and we're gonna make one plus one equal three. Is there gonna be an MOU signing? And how, how are you gonna proceed from this point? We're still going through the process of developing a recommendation for the boards to approve. Um, the task force that we created back in December is doing that. In mid-June, uh, we're going to make a presentation to the boards, to a joint board meeting, uh, with the same recommendation uh, for both boards, and then by the end of June, uh, in the respective board meetings, the, um, the, the board of directors of both organizations uh, will take a vote. A synopsis, what would you primarily like to see come out of this integration? Well, I, I think the integration is going to really um, provide the communities that we serve with a much stronger, impactful organization, uh, both state, federal levels, uh, and, and locally with small businesses. I think uh, small businesses are going to gain tremendously as well. The local chapter of the National Association of Letter Carriers Union is holding its 27th annual Stamp Out Hunger campaign this Saturday. Here's more. It's super easy for the uh, uh, area to be involved. All they have to do is put food out at their mailbox, and we, take, we bring that back, uh, and we distribute it to all those food pantries. Uh, sometimes it takes us till Tuesday or Wednesday to deliver it. Last year, we picked up a little over 50,000 pounds, which represents, if you see the food that's here, uh, represents about um, almost 2,000 buckets. And right here, we only have, eh, there's probably about 38 buckets here right now. So we have a ways to go to get another 
1,900 and some buckets. So we rely on the, um, our uh, customers to do that. Um, the other thing is um, last year we had some rain. So uh, this year it looks like it's gonna be clear, as much rain as we've had since the beginning of April. Uh, but it looks like it's gonna be clear Saturday. That tends to increase our total. We're so grateful to be here uh, once again to support this program and collaborate with the post office. Um, it's really quite an honor and we know the need is out there and, and Paul makes a great point. We really never know when that need might hit close to home. Someone we know, um, someone that might need just a little bit of a hand up to get to the next place and maybe um, it makes all that difference in the world. So uh, again, thank you to our sponsors, GM Refrigeration and Bank 5 who have continued to sponsor our bags. I believe we delivered 50,000 bags uh, this past week to local uh, businesses and homes in the Fall River, Somerset and Swansea area. So we added Somerset and Swansea this year and we're hoping to surpass that 50,000 pounds of food. Just a note, we each one of your bags came with one of these nice little post-its as well, just to talk about filling a bag helps a family in need, and also to bag healthy, non-perishable foods if you possibly can. So um, that's important to make sure that you're not putting out food that's expired because the, um, the recipients do take careful time to sort through all of the donations and make sure they're giving out um, good items to the families that are in need. A peace summit to bring awareness to preventing youth violence in Fall River school system was held in the city last week. The kickoff took place at Diamond Regional Vocational Technical High School, as we hear in this report. So today is the annual Peace by Peace Summit. We're going on about 12 years of doing this, and it's an awesome event where we invite all the local high schools here, um, and we have some really great activities um, based on social emotional wellness, mental well-being, and it's a way to unite the kids in the community and really teach them some great skills and give them some tools. We discuss everything from um, anti-bullying initiatives uh, to suicide prevention to mental wellness, you name it, um, anything, any of the major issues that these kids are dealing with today. Do the kids have any input on what's discussed? Yes, we've had a great core group of kids who have been part of the planning process, and those kids have been from Atlantis, Durfee, and Diamond. I personally have been bullied into not going to school all the way from middle school to my sophomore year in high school. Um, so I, I think bullying is also a big thing, too. Um, and I think it's just, we need to take it more seriously, students and as adults as well, because um, during me being bullied, nobody was there for me, really, anybody, until I got here and I, I had Miss Hetzler and um, Mr. Ramadan, they were a great support. The anti-violence program continued over the weekend with a community-oriented event held at the Boys and Girls Club on Bedford Street. We have perceived differences, but we're all the same in the want and need to love and be loved. In that, we're all the same. It doesn't matter how old we are, what language we speak, what religion we practice or non-religion, we're all the exact same in the want and need to love and be loved. And bottom line, a lot of what we're seeing in, uh, in our society, in our, in so, even maybe sometimes in our schools, is, is lack of connection. And love is connection, <laughs> by the way. Uh, and I learned that from little kids. So I get little kids into a room and I'll say, what does anger feel like in your body? And they'll say, blah, headache, fire, inferno, stomach ache. And then I'll say, what does love look like? And they, without thinking about it, they, they turn to one another and they throw their arms around one another. Or if they're sitting across from each other at tables, they go like this. They try to touch. And I realize then that love is connection. And here is this empowering concept, our program is called Choose Love, that we can actually choose this when we have the skills and tools. It becomes a choice, this essential element in our life. And we're gonna talk about that today. We're gonna to talk about how to choose it. You guys are gonna walk away with uh, some essential life skills, including a profound and powerful formula for choosing love that you can use from today forward, and you can spread and you can teach, um, this formula can lead you to choosing love in any situation, circumstance, or interaction. You're implementing this program in the schools? Yes, yeah, so this is uh, a part of our initiative that we've been working on uh, really uh, all year across uh, the agencies. So us, the charter school, the diamond, uh, the parochial schools, we're all working on this issue from a community perspective. So one of the things that we're doing is bringing this program into the elementary level and start with uh, really training around the core values, around the four pieces that she mentioned. I think it's a win-win for everybody. Uh, the more people we get involved, the better. 
We'll have more FRC Media News after this. Hi, welcome to Hot Dogs and Cool Cats. Today we have Remington. Mr. Remington here, he's a little bit of an older dude. He's about nine years old. You can see he's a little bit chubby, but he's very he's very jolly for it. Uh, very nice, very nice cat. Um, uh, not too energetic, but definitely friendly. Um, uh, would probably do better as a lap cat more than anything else. Uh, as far as what kind of homes he would do best in, um, he's, he's pretty tolerant of, of whatever is around him. Um, he's good with other cats. We've got him here in our communal room living with some right now. Um, he'd probably do well with, um, you know, let lower energy dogs, that sort of thing. Um, as far as uh, human companions, I think he would do well um, young, with young and old. Uh, he's, he's a pretty diverse uh, guy, and you can see he just kind of soaks up soaks up whatever you're dishing out. So if you'd like to meet Remington, come on down to 300 Linwood Street in Fall River, Massachusetts at Forever Paws Animal Shelter. Today we have Hopper. He is a little over a year old. Um, he's an Australian Terrier mix. Um, he does have three legs. Um, right now he's being really shy and quiet, but once he feels comfortable, he does get, he gets really playful. He would do um, best in a home with no children or any other animals. Um, maybe like a quieter home. He loves to go for walks. He loves to play with his toys. And he's missing his front um, right leg. He's very treat motivated. Uh, <laughs> if you want to come down and meet Hopper, um, at Forever Paws, we're located at 300 Linwood Street, Florida, Massachusetts. He would love to meet you. Officials at Diamond Regional Vocational Technical High School, Bristol Community College, and UMass Dartmouth have launched a new program that will allow Diamond engineering students to earn college credit while completing their high school education. Students will take classes in their junior and senior years administered by Bristol, with those credits being seamlessly transferred to UMass. Bristol President Dr. Laura Douglas believes this new pathway will ultimately lead to quality job opportunities within the region. This degree is very uh, important now with the current industries that we have in our region, but with the growth of offshore wind, these degrees in engineering will become even more important. You are going to be in critical demand. By the time you finish your uh, bachelor's degree, you will be picked up, or probably even in your junior year, you'll be doing internships in this field. So it's very, very uh, important to us. The career opportunities, the salaries, all of this work really points to the direction that we're taking at Bristol County, uh, Bristol Community College, which is to create a college-going culture in Bristol County. That'll do it for this edition of FRC Media News. You can watch FRC Media News Thursdays and Fridays at 6 p.m. and join us online at our website, frcmedianews.org. We leave you this week with a sample from last weekend's Fall River Symphony Orchestra's pop concert held at Bristol Community College. For all of us here at FRC Media News, I'm Keith Tebow. Have a great week. We'll see you next Thursday.